It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this talk is Public Health and Leadership Introduction. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include define leadership, explain why adaptive leadership is important for public health, define the difference between social marketing and community engagement, and discuss some basic concepts of extreme leadership. The following phrases have been used to describe leadership. The art of mobilizing others to struggle for shared aspirations, sticking your neck out or taking risks when it's the right thing to do, living dangerously, often exceeding authority, withstanding criticism, is usually lonely, and successfully resolves problems. I've also included Steve Farber's definition of leadership, who uses the acronym LEAP, including love, edge or energy, audacity, and proof. Some traits of leaders include vision and values, situational perception and action that relates to anticipation skills, power, charisma, intelligence, and someone who people follow or someone who guides and directs others. I would like to focus on the importance of a leader casting vision. De Bono et al. in a book titled Moments in Leadership stated that leadership qualities begin with a unique vision. Steve Farber in his book, The Radical Leap said, a vision statement doesn't generate energy, love does. Great ideas do, principles and values do. But vision from the heart is by definition an expression of love. And not only is that more energizing, it is energy. He used Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech as an example. He didn't have to hand out 250,000 laminated cards, his vision statement at the Lincoln Memorial on that hot August day in 1963. Watch the tape. It was pure energy. The speech clearly expressed Dr. King's personal vision. The speech was alive. So instead of reciting a vision statement, feel it. Take it deep within yourself. The vision needs to come from your heart. It needs to say, this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is what I think we can do together if we put our hearts into it. If you can do that, you don't need a document with a printed vision statement because you've become a living, breathing vision. You must deeply believe in the vision of an organization or you can't put your heart into it. If you can't do that, move on. For you surely can't cast vision for others if you don't believe it. You won't inspire employees and they for sure won't want to follow you and you shouldn't be leading that organization. Move on to a place where you can passionately lead. According to Linsky and Heifetz's book, Leadership on the Line, leadership skills can be divided into two broad categories, technical leadership or management, and adaptive leadership that I will also call extreme leadership. Both of the skill sets are needed for effective leaders. Knowing the difference and when to appropriately use them is extremely important. This slide lists some key attributes of technical leadership or management. Management solutions are fairly obvious with a fix requiring minor adjustments no major changes in the way things are done. Generally, people resist change, rising exponentially with a major overhaul. So minor changes will likely be less controversial in the organization than major ones. Things will continue much as they have in the past. In these situations, leadership can orchestrate the fix. They can manage it. The checkers are all on the board. They just need to be rearranged a bit. There may be some minor resistance in the organization, but these are not earth shattering events that upset the apple cart. So managers face little risk of criticism, anger and hostility with many technical management decisions. 
That is not the case with adaptive situations. Adaptive problems are often seen in times of crises. The solution to adaptive problems is not readily apparent. Adaptive situations and solutions need new approaches and major changes in the way an organization functions. A leader can throw all the technical management fixes they can generate at the problem and it still persists. Adaptive problems require a group process to find an effective solution. So the role of the leader in an adaptive situation is not to line up the checkers. The leader must facilitate the group to find the checkers. This is actually true community engagement, facilitating communities to own their problems and solutions. Adaptive skills are essential for a leader to truly engage a target community. Adaptive leadership is also defined as extreme leadership. I want to reemphasize that effective leaders need both sets of skills and competencies, technical management skills and adaptive or group facilitation skills. According to Linsky and Heifetz in Leadership on the Line, the most common source of leadership failure we've been able to identify in politics, community life, business, or the nonprofit sector is that people, especially those in positions of authority, treat adaptive challenges like technical problems. In other words, they try to manage their way out of situations that require group process. Understanding the difference between technical and adaptive skills and when to use them is critical for effective leaders of any organization. So why are extreme leadership skills needed in public health? I think all of us realize that the future of public health will be challenging. Public health faces complex problems that will require complex solutions, requiring adaptive skills and leaders that can effectively facilitate group processes. This slide lists some, but not all of the attributes of extreme leadership and includes taking appropriate risks. Risk comes with fear. And we've been conditioned to believe that fear is bad. That's not totally true. Fear can be both good and bad. Fear can save your life, keeping you from doing something stupid, but it can also paralyze a person, keeping them from doing something great, learning something new, or growing as a leader. Another attribute of extreme leadership is the ability to weather hostility and criticism. As we've mentioned before, Adaptive situations are associated with major changes in an organization. People in organizations generally resist change, especially major change, resulting in hostility and criticism. Extreme leadership translates into an ability to handle that hostility and criticism, maintain composure, and continue on, which is not easy. Another attribute is the ability to compromise, realizing that the goal is to win wars, not just a battle. Extreme leadership may occasionally need to push beyond lines of authority. In many extreme leadership situations, there is a vacuum of authority. Extreme leaders can effectively and with wisdom go beyond authority, making good decisions and realizing how far they can push the envelope and still survive. Extreme leadership focuses on outcomes and doesn't shy away from a problem or challenge. In fact, extreme leadership thrives on challenge, not comfort, often seeking out difficult problems to solve. As you might expect, extreme leadership relies on excellent facilitation skills, being able to lead a challenging group process to find an effective solution. This is the heart of community engagement, adaptive leadership skills. One of the major tool sets for public health is community engagement. That's why adaptive leadership or extreme leadership is so important for effective public health leaders. This slide just lists the major tools we have to change risky behaviors. First, there's policy developed by governments, local, state, and national, businesses, schools, and other organizations implemented by statute and rule. Policy can either be good or bad. Good policy sets an environment encouraging healthy choices. 
Another set of tools is a clinical setting with clinicians providing one-on-one -on -one counseling, a powerful tool. The third set of tools are population-based interventions, the domain of public health. Population-based interventions can be subdivided into two subsets of tools, social marketing and community engagement. Community engagement is a common term used in our society, yet true community engagement is a relatively new concept in public health. All of these tools, policy, clinical, and public health, social marketing, and community engagement are needed to change risky behaviors. The integration of these tools, breaking down silos, as recommended by the Institute of Medicine in their 2012 integration report, will be a key to effectively impacting risky behaviors. So let's briefly discuss the major public health tools to change risky behaviors and start with social marketing. Social marketing has been a major part of health messaging since the 1970s when Kotler and Zaltman demonstrated that the marketing tools used to sell items could also be effective in influencing health-related behaviors. Public health spends millions of dollars each year, and rightly so, on social marketing. The second major subset of tools in the public health toolkit to change risky behaviors is community engagement. Community engagement has been around since the beginning of aggregate human existence. Community engagement in a nutshell encourages cohesive groups of people to own their problems and solutions. Therefore, true community engagement requires effective group process. Community problems are generally complex and require complex solutions. From our previous discussion, these complex solutions can't be managed away by a leader. It will require the work and effort of the cohesive group or community. Much that's currently done in the name of community engagement is actually community coercion. This slide summarizes the major differences between community engagement and community coercion. Community coercion can be illustrated by the following sequence. A community problem or problems are identified by external specialists like public health scientists, often using public health and health care data sets to identify those problems. The external specialist then, often with a small group of experts, develops a plan to solve the problems often based on best or promising practices. These external specialists or public health scientists then apply for and hopefully receive a grant. Once the grant has been received, the external specialist or scientist tries to sell the idea to the community. There are many variations on this theme, but a major point is that with most of these programs, the control of the process rests with individuals external to the community. The community or community leadership may have been involved, but not in control of the process. In my experience, this approach has never resulted in true community ownership of their problems and solutions. It always remains an external program applied to the community, not owned by the community. In this situation, when the grant goes away, so does the program. Coercion is when things are done to and for people. In true community engagement, things are done with people. This is also known by many other names, including community empowerment. True community engagement relies on effective group process to solve these complex adaptive problems. In true community engagement, the community, the cohesive group, is involved and in control from the very beginning, not the external specialist or scientist. The community will determine whether there will even be a program. To do this, Public health leaders need special adaptive skills to facilitate communities or cohesive groups to own their problems and solutions. The main point is that in true community engagement, the community owns the program, controls, and runs it. The National Institute of Health said in their Principles of Community Engagement publication, Engaging a community is ultimately about facilitating community-driven action, not external-driven action, a key point for community engagement. Community engagement is facilitating a process of problem-solving, not just accomplishing a project. 
This is a problem with most of our grants, project-oriented with strict requirements and timelines that undermines community ownership. One of my first international community engagement situations was in northern Mexico, a rural community outside Monterey. The community had a major issue with amoebiasis caused by Entamoeba histolytica, resulting in complications like liver abscesses and occasionally death. Entamoeba histolytica is passed through the fecal oral route due to poor sanitation. The cause was fairly clear. On the west side of town, there was a field used by farmers as a latrine. Raw human sewage was running from that field across a dirt road into a small pond, the community's water source. From my perspective, they needed ventilated improved pit latrines and water protection. During the meetings with community leaders, the issue of amoebiasis was discussed. They fully understood the transmission of this disease. When asked what their major health and wellness goal was, they responded, we need to build a soccer field. That wasn't what I expected. I didn't understand their reasoning, but had to defer to the major core concepts of community engagement, community ownership and control, and facilitating a process of problem solving versus a project. I encouraged them to build their soccer field, which they did. They eventually addressed the sanitation issues related to amoebiasis, but in their, not my, priority. This is true community engagement, community control and ownership of their problems and solutions. Our role as external specialists is to come alongside the community and encourage them by facilitating a process of problem solving, not just the accomplishment of a project. For a few minutes, let's consider the philosophy of culture. This diagram is what I call the cultural egg. It's adapted from G. Linwood Barney's Layers of Culture. The arrow represents the idea that our behaviors result from deeper influences. At the very center of this cultural egg rests our worldview or deep beliefs. These deep beliefs can be divided into four major categories. Our beliefs about ourselves as human beings, our beliefs about nature, the supernatural, and time, the past, the present, and future. These deep beliefs are often aggregated into what I call our ologies, including ideology, or philosophy of life, and cosmology, or how the universe formed. These core beliefs, or worldviews, then inform our values, the next layer of the cultural egg. These are the things we feel are important. These deep beliefs and values then set the base for the way we do things, our institutions, including how we marry, how we educate our children, how we enforce our laws, how we govern ourselves, how we run our businesses and organizations, etc. Finally, all of those deeper layers emerge as our individual and organizational behaviors, the area we want to influence. The major concept is that the root cause for many of our risky behaviors may be driven by our deep beliefs and values. Let's now use this cross-cultural communications diagram to discuss how this relates to technical and adaptive leadership skills and also social marketing and community engagement. Technical situations generally rest at the institutional and behavioral levels of the cultural egg. Technical fixes operate using the current deep beliefs and values of the organization, but require changing the institutional way of doing things. With technical changes, we're not asking individuals or the organization to change their deep beliefs and values. They will remain intact. Therefore, these changes are not associated with great risk, major resistance, or threat. These are management issues solved by good technical leadership skills and competencies. Adaptive fixes, on the other hand, seek to change the deep beliefs and values that drive the institutions and ultimately behaviors. Whenever anyone attempts to change our worldview and values, it invariably results in significant resistance, anger, criticism, and even hostility. Humans don't change beliefs and values easily. It's the way we think, feel, and believe, and from our perspective, it's the way to think, feel, and believe. We are deeply committed to our deep beliefs and values. And if anyone thinks, feels, and believes differently, 
they're obviously wrong. Our emotions are often stirred when our beliefs and values are challenged. Cultural clashes of worldviews and values has likely been the cause of most, if not all, wars throughout the world's long history. The challenge for an adaptive extreme leader and facilitator is being able to remain neutral, suppressing our emotions related to our beliefs and values as we facilitate a community to deal with their adaptive challenges. This is not easy, since facilitators are human beings and are deeply attached to their worldview. If a community engagement facilitator finds himself or herself crossing the threshold, unable to facilitate neutrally, it's wise to transfer the facilitation to others. People will rarely take significant risks or invest their time and resources in things they don't deeply believe in. But they will invest energy, resources, and time to meet their perceived needs, their priorities, not the priorities and perceived needs of others unless they're similar. So cultural communications experts have taught us that our behaviors are the result of deeper influences in each of our lives, our beliefs and values. In community engagement, it's extremely important to ascertain and focus on the deep beliefs and values of the target community. The things the community members feel are important to them, their priorities, their perceived needs, these are the things they will commit time and resources in to accomplish. This slide focuses on how the cultural egg relates to social marketing and community engagement. A social marketing expert at a national immunization conference described it very well when he said, I don't really care what a person thinks, feels, or believes. I just want a change in the target behavior. In other words, social marketing aims at the outer layer of the cultural egg, the area of behaviors. Social marketing does work. That's why public health invests millions of dollars each year in social marketing campaigns with convincing presentations, good culturally appropriate messages delivered through effective messaging channels at appropriate key times, risky behaviors can change for a time. The problem with many behaviors is permanency of change. If individuals have unhealthy beliefs and values that drive those risky behaviors. Excellent social marketing programs may encourage these individuals to change a risky behavior for a short time, but if those beliefs and values that drive that risky behavior remain, there will be recidivism and relapse. That helps us understand situations that are geared for social marketing. One-time events or behaviors like immunizations or cancer screenings. An individual doesn't need to deeply believe in those things as long as a good social marketing campaign can get them to get the influenza or zoster immunization or complete a colonoscopy for bowel cancer. After that, we can use social marketing to influence them to do another one-time healthy behavior. Social marketing uses highly trained communication specialists who know how to assess, develop, and deliver appropriate social marketing messages. These specialists are generally external to the target community. Community engagement specialists would say that changes in the beliefs, feelings, and thinking of individuals and communities are essential for permanent changes of risky behaviors. The focus of community engagement is at the level of worldview or deep beliefs and values of the cultural egg. If beliefs and values that drive risky behaviors are changed, then more permanent changes of behavior result with less recidivism and relapse. Social marketing, clinical counseling, and good policies can reinforce community engagement programs that target deep beliefs and values. This underlines the importance of effective integration coordination and collaboration of these tool sets to change risky behaviors. It takes patience to work with communities, facilitating community discussions around the difficult task of changing unhealthy beliefs and values. We have to realize that the only individuals that have the right and power to change their deep beliefs and values are the community and cultural members themselves, not external public health specialists or government leaders. Community engagement like this 
doesn't fit most grants with their rigid guidance, external agendas, project orientations, and timelines that undermine true community engagement, the foundation of which is community ownership and control. Community engagement requires specialized skills and techniques to facilitate discussions around changes in beliefs and values. Instead of utilizing highly trained communication specialists, like we discussed in social marketing, community engagement commonly focuses on horizontal communication systems that exist in every true community, a powerful tool to change beliefs, values, and resultant behaviors. There are several facilitation techniques that can be utilized to engage communities. Lepsis is one technique I've used in Africa and the United States. It is a participatory teaching method, a facilitation mechanism that encourages a community or group to discuss their problems and seek appropriate solutions. Lepsis works best in groups of 10 to 20 individuals. The facilitator must be neutral, suppressing the interjection of their personal beliefs and values into the discussion. The acronym for LEPSIS refers to the following. The LE stands for learner-centered, moving at the pace and in line with the interests and needs of the learner. This means the facilitator needs to be flexible, often changing the lesson during a session. The P stands for problem posing, using starters like open-ended stories that will lead to questions regarding community needs and concerns. The first S stands for self-discovery, discussions that lead to potential solutions for the community's needs and concerns. The A stands for action-oriented. What can the group do to move toward solution of identified problems within a given time frame? The last S stands for the spiritual component, often very important and powerful for changing risky behaviors. Many cultures around the world have supernatural beliefs and values that can positively influence community behaviors. No matter the personal spiritual orientation of the facilitator, he or she must understand and not ignore the power of community and spiritual beliefs to influence healthy behaviors. Once again, a community engagement facilitator must be careful not to interject their beliefs and values as they facilitate discussions. Most people are members of many communities, not just one. Let's start with the definition of community. I define community as a group of people who know each other by first name and also have a sense of shared responsibility for each other. This is different than the geopolitical definitions commonly used in public health. Groups that meet this definition often can be engaged using community engagement concepts. Communities significantly impact their members in almost every aspect of their lives, including how they think, what they believe, and how they act. There are five main community groups, including rural towns with populations up to 1,000 to 1,500 people. Some studies suggest that people can only know about 1,000 to 1,500 people by first name. I was raised in a small town, a true community in central North Dakota. As a young boy, if I fell and cut my knee somewhere in town, someone would take me and clean it and bandage it and call my mom. If I did something wrong, that also was relayed to my parents. I was raised by that community. That community was like my extended family. Schools comprise another group of communities. Schools are complex with several sub-communities, staff and students stratified by age group, homerooms, and school organizations. Faith-based organizations often function like communities, expressing supernatural beliefs. The workplace may occasionally meet the criteria of community revolving around economic interests. Then there are other organizations and groups that may also operate like communities, including Kiwanis, Optimists, Knights of Columbus, Rotary International, fraternities, sororities, 
internet groups like Facebook and Twitter, ethnic groups, prostitutes, street children, etc. There are some basic community engagement concepts that apply to all these five groups, yet there are unique concepts and skills that apply to some. For example, engaging faith-based communities requires an understanding of how to facilitate discussions with these groups to use their beliefs in the supernatural to deal with risky behaviors. For schools, it's important to understand key differences between the worldview and cultural dimensions of children and young people versus adults and how that impacts things like messaging. The priority of engaging a workplace community will need to address the profitability of the business. As mentioned previously, community engagement seeks to find and engage horizontal communication systems. All communities have horizontal communicators, often informal leaders, also known as opinion leaders, champions, and influential individuals in class. Horizontal communication systems have incredible potential to impact the beliefs, values, and behaviors of the community. Consistent messages across all communities that an individual belongs to will help individuals reach a behavioral threshold faster than focusing on only one community or sub-community in a target area. Therefore, a major community engagement strategy is to reach as many communities in a target area as possible. In summary, casting a compelling vision is an essential attribute of successful leaders. A successful leader must have both technical and adaptive leadership skills. Social marketing and community engagement are major public health tool sets to change risky behaviors. Community engagement is facilitating communities in the process of problem solving. Take your public health practice skills to the next level. Our specialized certificate courses give you an opportunity to work systematically through a public health topic and demonstrate your understanding of that material in a capstone project. Learn more and sign up at ndphtn.com certificates.